This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. Just sitting here like looking like a bum I don't want people to go oh my god so I'm just doing you can you guys hear me I'm not sure if anything's even working can you hear me okay good yeah okay good <laughs> okay. Yeah, so just thought I'd give this a shot here. Uh, we're still doing the, um, on the 31st, I'll still be doing donation night to charity no matter what. So uh, <clears throat> even if that's the only thing I do. But, you know, there's moments where I feel better than other times. I don't know. Well, the patch I have on sort of feels like Ben Gay, so it distracts your mind. <laughs> All right. So I've had these patches, Salon Pat, or whatever they're called, like Salon. Anyways, seems to kind of work mentally a little bit. But uh, yesterday... I saw the surgeon at Providence and he said I need surgery to fuse the C6 and 7 I think together um, and then open up space for my nerve roots uh, but then my dad was like well is this guy any good or what so now my brother is helping me uh, check out like at UW to see if you know they're going to do a second opinion there uh, they also have great surgeons up there, so, well, you know, who, who knows? I, I want to have one of the best, though, okay? <laughs> I don't want to have, like, some damn, uh... And the, the crazy part is, is after I'm, uh... Oh, thank you, Shogun Love. I don't have the audio on, so... I, I'm using a different version in case we do the call-in thing at the end. <clears throat> Um, I already remember what I was going to say now. Uh, what the hell was it? Oh yeah, after I'm the surgery, I guess you have to wear one of those neck braces for six weeks. And then, uh, you know, like four months before I can play golf. But yeah, I'm definitely going to get a second opinion. But I, I think the opinion is going to be the same. Uh, the main reason for that is I, I, I'm kind of look. I want to try to find the best, you know, like one of the best. You know, there's there's so many neurosurgeons that are awesome, you know, but it's it's hard to become a neurosurgeon if you suck, you know. It's like that's pretty much, you know, top of the line type surgeons there. But you know, why not get try to find the best in that industry? Yeah, so I'm having my MRI sent up there. Um, yeah, so there you go. That's kind of where I am now. And then, oh, then this is what kind of sucks is my insurance for getting the pain medic, you know, injection. They said, well, we only inject for your insurance cover on Fridays. And this next week is filled till Friday. So we might be able to get you in on the Friday after that. I mean, what, is, what the hell does that even mean? You're in, you know, you only do like uh, Providence insurance people on a Friday I mean who gives a shit what day it is what difference does it make anyways man I'm learning stuff now it's just it's so dumb one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life 
Now, I'm sorry, you're going to have to suffer for an extra week because we only do the shots on Fridays for that. <laughs> Isn't that the dumbest thing you've ever heard in your life? Yeah, it sounds crazy. I, I, I didn't even know what the hell I was listening to. Let me see, if it was your brother and they had that, would you sneak them in early? Okay, well, do that for me, you idiot. So it might be another two weeks. I don't know, I'll see if I can try a different route there. I know, that's absolutely crazy, isn't it? So I saw a post somebody made in um, Gray Hughes Investigates on Facebook. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the only thing I could find on this one it was a guy named Paul Aikman. And it says, Authorities said Wednesday no motive has been established in the stabbing death of an Oklahoma City man whose body was found along the Turner Turnpike in Lincoln County. The Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation identified the victim as Paul Douglas Aikman, 35. The Highway Patrol said a Fort Hood, Texas soldier found Aikman's body Wednesday morning. Okay, and then... This is the, uh, <laughs> it's crazy though. Look. A murder charge filed in a 35-year-old cold case out of Lincoln County. Attorney General Mike Hunter filed a first-degree murder charge against this man, Earl Wilson. Prosecutors say DNA evidence connects him to the death of Paul Aikman at a rest stop off the Turner Turnpike in 1985. Wilson already in prison for unrelated crimes. Uh, this is just a short one. Oklahoma Attorney General Mike Hunter announced Monday that he has filed first-degree murder charges in a cold case from 1985 involving a murder in Lincoln County. Paul Aikman was stabbed to death in September 1985 at a rest stop on the Turner Turnpike. A news release states that at the time of the murder, Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation agents collected cigarette butts and latent prints from the crime scene. A DNA profile was developed from one of the cigarette butts, but the case eventually went cold. In 2019, OSBI criminalists and Forensic Science Center alerted agents that during a search of the National DNA Database CODIS, a potential DNA hit was obtained and matched Earl Wilson, 55. According to the news release, criminalists then matched the latent print impressions taken from the crime scene to Wilson. Man, that is just crazy. Advances in DNA technology are allowing authorities. Yeah, we've heard that. For 35 years, Paul Aikman's family has ached not knowing who was responsible for his murder. OSBI director Ricky Adams said, 35 years have passed. But we have not forgotten about Paul, thanks to science and determined police work. You know what's weird about the uh, the CODIS deal? How come there isn't just this machine churning out comparisons? I mean, we've got like these freaking supercomputers, right? How come they didn't put, you know, that guy's DNA? And as soon as you, you know, it's always checking the DNA against new submissions. So like this guy's been in prison for a while. And uh, obviously his DNA was uploaded to CODIS and then, oh, hey, let's check that again. Well, why do you have to decide to check on that again? I think it should always be checking automatically. Like as soon as DNA is up, it doesn't even, you know, uh, when I say as soon as something's uploaded, it doesn't really matter. What I'm saying is it's just always checking. So, you know, if you did just submit some DNA, it's going to check immediately. And obviously normally they do that. But you got to have it keep running because there's, there might be a hit from old DNA on somebody that's sitting in there. Don't you think? Yeah, well, just you know, however they do it now, just have it automated where it tests literally, you know, thousands of unknown DNA profiles against the entire national database of CODIS 24-7 all the time. Because, I mean, this is like the third or fourth one where, oh, 
Yeah, we found him in CODIS after checking again. Yeah, it would be very simple to make. They already do it, just have somebody automate the damn thing. And then have, you know, make sure that... I think I've mentioned this before, but make sure that the correct agencies listed for each of the samples, as soon as there's a hit, it immediately sends out an alert, maybe even a phone call, and goes, hey, hey, bing, 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 hey, we got a match, right? Makes sense to me. <laughs> hey, for a minute there, I, th I forgot my neck hurt. That was cool. I was just talking. I don't give a shit if they'd be overwhelmed with anything. I, I don't even give a damn, you know? At least it's an answer, and then they have an answer, you know? Overwhelmed? How would that be overwhelming? You just automate the damn thing. Okay, uh, let's see. I was going to do this one. I actually looked for in North Dakota, and I was looking at these cases, and they were the same ones that I looked at before. So this is one. This one is William Wolf Jr. Never been solved. 1978. Well, we only have 127. I guess. See how quickly your momentum fades away when you don't do your show. People go, oh, yeah, 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 we'll, we'll keep watching. Yeah. yeah. All right, here we go. Minnesota authorities say they have recovered a man's body cut in half from the Red River near, near here. Lieutenant Don Jones of the Moorhead Police Department said the body was found in the river about four miles south of Georgetown about 1.30 p.m. Sunday. Jones said the body had been cut in half through the torso, placed in two plastic bags, and dumped in the river. He described the victim as Caucasian with an approximate age of 20 to 40 and fairly large build. Jones said the identity of the victim has not been established. Jones described the incident as homicide type. Hey, thanks, Nan Sullivan. Yep, got to keep on building. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the things I feel bad about being injured. I know people can donate to charity, but I, I want to build my channel's donations up. You know, I mean, that's kind of like what we're doing. I mean, we're almost at 10000 I'm going to try to get, even if I have to dig into my own PayPal stuff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get, it, get us up to 10000 for the year, regardless, on the 31st. It's going to be crazy. I mean, that's pretty crazy, right? Ten thousand dollars to crime-related charities. We're at eighty-two hundred now. Let's see if we can get to ten. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm only gonna do shows if I feel like I can do it. Okay, like if I feel like I can sit there for a while and um, feel, you know, like I can get through the show. <laughs> You know, if I don't feel good, I, like last night, it was just not good. And so, yeah. Okay, here's the next day's article. Hey, thanks, Ro and Zozo. <laughs> I appreciate it. You know, and it's funny, too, because you guys, um, I don't know if I tell you, but I really appreciate all of you a lot. You know, such encouraging, you know, words and, um, you know, when I can't do the show, I actually miss you guys, so there you go. It's like a bunch of, you know what it is? It's like cheers with 250, 300 people, <laughs> right? Hey, thanks, Wally Gator and Allison R. All right. Getting it, got, building it up again. And Miss Red Badger. I'll let a little air out of this really quick. 
Okay. Clay County Sheriff's Invest... Oh, hold on. My phone's ringing. It might be something related. Yeah, that was just, I'm trying to get my uh, MRI on a CD, and they, it was supposed to be open today where my wife works, and somehow it didn't, uh, they were closed. So, it was related. <sighs> okay. So now let me get back, you probably all already read this damn thing, but I'll do it anyway. Clay County Sheriff's Investigators Larry Costello says the man... Who, who was cut in two and dumped in the Red River near Georgetown was probably murdered elsewhere. Canuis found the body Sunday wrapped in plastic bags and floating in the river. Man, that would have been a nightmare. Yeah, thanks uh, Miss Red Badger up there. Costello said there is a great possibility that the body was put in the bags for transportation. The sheriff's spokesman said they said investigators now think they have identified the victim but need to check further to confirm it. And then a week later, the FBI has been asked to help the investigation of the William Wolfe murder case. That's who it was determined. FBI spokesman Russell Anderson said the Fargo Police Department asked his agency to make inquiry inquiries in the case. The body of Wolf 21 um, of Fargo, I guess, was found August 20th floating in the Red River north of Cragness, Minnesota. Hey, thank you, Sarah M. That's very kind. Thank you. The body has been cut in half and packed in garbage bags. This, this one's in uh, North Dakota, okay? So you sort of wonder... Like, why weren't they using a wood chip? That's just a joke. I know, a sick, a sick one. But every time I think of North Fargo or anything like that, the only ever thing I think of is a wood chipper. Are you guys with me on that one? Especially with murders? And it seems like, yeah, it's all. It, it just seems like that just pops into my head every time. And then here we got somebody cut in half, put in two bla uh, plastic bags. Okay, and then uh, Clay County investigators are turning to the public for help to solve the murder of a Fargo man. William Wolfe Jr.'s body was found in the Red River near Cragness, Minnesota, uh, I guess it's Minnesota, about a month ago. His body had been cut in half through the torso and put into two plastic bags. Clay County Attorney Ed Killinger said a reward for an undisclosed amount will be offered to anyone with information. Well, what do you mean an undisclosed amount? Hey, okay, I know where he is. Okay, you get $10. Killinger said the reward is being offered by the seven local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies involved in the investigation. Okay, so that was a reward, and then... Uh... 
A Clay County, Minnesota grand jury, jury will be called November 27th. This is kind of interesting. Whether probable cause exists to charge a person in the August murder of a Fargo man, authorities said. They actually charged his, mom, his dad at one point. The body of William P. Wolf, 21, was found August 20, floating in the Red River, north of Moorhead. The body had been cut in half, and investigator, investigating officers said an autopsy indicated the man's throat had also been cut. So that's something new there. Edward F. So that's probably how he died, and then for convenience of disposal and carrying, probably cut the person in half, put him into two bags. Edward F. Killinger of Moorhead, assistant county attorney, said the grand jury will convene at Moorhead. He said he is expected proceedings to take about two days. Yeah, and then here's the, uh, and that, I think it was about his dad. Grand jury indicts father in death of son last summer. A Clay County grand jury has indicted William Leo Wolf of West Fargo on four counts of murder and manslaughter. The body of the younger wolf, 21, of Fargo was found August 20th in the Red River near Georgetown. Wolf 44 was charged Wednesday with one count, each of first, second, third degree murder and one count of manslaughter. The older wolf was arraigned before Judge Gaylord, uh, let's see, set bail for 25,000. Yeah, well, it turned out he had not, you know, he never got arrested or charged or, you know, convicted of anything. So he didn't do it. Cass County authorities have gone to court to try to force a 24-year-old burglary suspect to answer questions about the murder of William Wolf. The suspect was questioned during a state attorney's inquest on January 11th, so that was during that inquest, that, that was a different person, and refused to answer a number of questions. Assistant State Attorney Robert Hoy told Cass County District Court Friday he had hoped the burglary suspect would lead authorities to persons involved in the murder, but the suspect's attorney, Bruce Johnson, advised him not to answer the questions. Um, the, the judge ruled the suspect did not have to answer certain other questions about the murder. Do you see Billy Wolf being beaten before his death? Johnson said he would appeal Grass's rule. Anyways, I don't, I mean, obviously that guy never got arrested either. And then I found uh, an article on, you know, in Google. Just a second. Uh, shoot. Let me try to use... That sucks. <clears throat> I'm going to try to use Firefox here. Because it wants me to... I just can't stand all the pop-up ads and shit that everybody has now. It just drives me nuts. Okay. Every now and then, someone confesses to killing Billy Wolf Jr. The problem is, the real killers... And am I going to be able to do this? Maybe I'll try to do like a screen grab. There we go. Grab that part. <laughs> Just a second. Yeah, this is fun.
that. There we go. I don't know if I'm missing some parts or what, but I'm trying. Okay. Let's see what we get here. Every now and then someone confesses to killing Billy Wolf Jr. The problem is the real killers, the ones authorities say actually murdered and severed the body of this 21-year-old Fargo man haven't come forward. It was 30 years ago today. Every now and then someone confesses to killing Billy Wolf Jr. The problem is, or it says it again. The case remains one of the most gruesome unsolved murders in local history, though local investigators say they know who committed the crime, they just don't have enough evidence to bring their case to a jury without a real confession. But you know how many times you hear that and it doesn't really, it's not real, like they always think, oh yeah, yeah we know who did it. You know, almost every one of these cold cases that are solved, they had the guy in their sights, but it wasn't that guy. They have this guy that they think is the killer, but it wasn't him. The case was highly publicized with several details depicting in forum articles, such as the color of Wolf's clothing, the six pennies in his pocket, and the way his upper torso was placed head first into a bag. We've looked into each and every one of them in depth so as not to have anybody say that somebody came forth and you didn't even bother. Um, often confessions come from people who are mentally unstable, especially around the August 20th anniversary of the discovery of Wolf's body. Most of them you can pretty much eliminate right away. Just last year authorities finished roughly two-year inquiry into a convicted burglar serving time in a Nebraska prison who claimed to have killed Wolf. He had some information that piqued our interest, but then after we checked everything out, he had to have been like 12 years old at the time. Authorities think the man originally from Fargo-Moorhead area made up the confession using prison gossip and secondhand information available to gain attention. He has falsely confessed to other homicides as well, but there are others who know what really happened. Somebody needs to clear their conscience before they die, Green said. They have had hard lives and they'll have to face their maker. A grisly discovery. August 20, 1978 was, was a typical Sunday. The afternoon sky was partly cloudy. It was warm. And there was a subtle wind as David Wambach canoed the river. Hey, thanks. Maybe sunshine. About three miles north of Cragness, Minnesota, Wombat came across two garbage bags floating in the river. The Fargo man partially opened one bag and immediately alerted authorities. About three miles north of Cragness... Oh yeah, right there, that says right there. Investigators found half a man who later was identified through dental records as Wolf in each of the bags. Uh, his mother... Betty had reported her second of four children missing three days earlier. One bag was caught in a downed tree on the Minnesota side of the river. It contained Wolf's upper body, uh, head first in the bag. His lower half was discovered in a second bag caught in a tree trunk about 200 yards downstream on the North Dakota side of the river. He was clad in a tan t-shirt green work pants and work boots. He had been cut in the waist and had a long gash across his face slashing his throat. It had to be done with some type of bandsaw or something that made one uh, swatch when it went through. 
Costello was a deputy sheriff at the time. And well, now we're getting closer to the wood chipper theory, right? Authorities estimated Wolf had been dead about 72 hours. 30, 30 years later, Wambach still resembled, look, I remembered looking around to see if he really was alone when he found Wolf's remains. You don't know if someone saw you, he said. Wambach is still reluctant to talk about the discovery or what he saw. I didn't realize what all was taking place at the time, he said, calling the whole incident a scary moment. He admits that he kept an old newspaper clipping about the incident, but he rarely thinks about it. Gossip spread quickly about the case, especially after Wolf's father, whom the victim was named after, was charged with the killing. Investigators have cleared him of any involvement, but won't divulge more about the initial case against him. The charges came three months after Wolf's body was discovered and confirmed rumors that have been afloat for some time. But three months after the charges were dismissed, prosecutors said the case against Wolf's father wasn't strong enough. Investigators reopened the case in 1987 and embraced a different theory. They now believe Wolf's death was drug-related and involved more than one killer. They now believe Wolf was killed somewhere in Cass County and that three, of, three or four people were involved. Investigators deduced a message was being sent based on the gruesome nature of the crime. There were trying to get some information out of him that he didn't have and it went too far and he ended up dead. Went too far? Yeah, that's an understatement, right? Yeah, I think anytime you, you know, slice somebody's face with a miter saw, you're, you know, Hey, thanks, Crystal Ann. Yeah. When it comes to drugs, it's either you didn't pay for them or you took them. Authorities over the years have cleared some people originally believed were connected to the case, including Wolf's father. Charging him might have been a way to try to straighten out early statements. When I went through it, there was absolutely nothing there. Investigators will keep in contact with the Wolf's. Uh, so let's see the last time his mother talked to her, her son Billy that was August 15th Betty Wolf reports her son missing two days later three days later a Fargo man canoeing found two plastic bags with his body in it cut in half at the waist or torso there authorities identified the body as 21 year old Billy Wolf just two days after that a week after that Billy's father is charged, and then the next year, January, William Wolf pleads not guilty to the charges. A month after that, charges against William Wolf are dismissed. The prosecutor says an ongoing investigation has produced some evidence that indicated Wolf was innocent. The prosecutor also stated, states the murder weapon has not been located and the actual site of the murder has not been determined. 1987, a team of investigators reopened the case and generates fresh leads. A new theory is developed. Authorities combined an entire case into one file. Previously, material, material was included in various files processed by several law enforcement agencies. If anybody knows anything about it, call 701-241-5800. Eight hundred four seven two two one eight five or seven zero one three two eight five five zero zero. You can see it on the screen too. Right. Okay. Now moving on to another one just a minute and this is from believe it or not 1959 
Fern Romero. And this, this, that's the image that's in the thumbnail. But that's her right there. And this is in Oklahoma. Fern Romero, young wife of Fort, I don't know if that says, it's uh, blurred there. Army captain was found dead in the bedroom of her North Luton home Wednesday. She was definitely murdered, Detective Captain Cleo Stout said. The nude body of Mrs. Romero, 25, was discovered by neighbors who went to investigate the body, or investigate. The body was found in a pool of blood in a bedroom. Her throat had been slashed. There was no evidence of a struggle. The victim's two sons, Chris, six months, and Timmy, 27 months, were in the house when the body was found. Her husband, Captain uh, Louis, I don't know if it's, yeah, probably Louis, Louis Romero, was located, or Louise, I guess, late Wednesday afternoon in Mountain View, Texas. Uh, Mountain View, Texas. It's hard for me to read because I'm leaning back in a chair and I'm like, four feet away from the article even though it's big he was to return home from Fort Bliss late Wednesday night on or early Thursday the woman was completely nude and there's a good possibility she was raped investigating officers weren't ruling out the possibility of robbery either the victim's purse was missing and some fingerprints were taken from inside the home we're checking every angle in the case, Captain Stout added. Police found a pack, a pocket knife with a three and a half inch blade on the kitchen table, but there was no blood on it. It was for the, uh, it has for the present time been discounted as the murder weapon. The body was found about noon by Louise Bunch, who lives next door. Bunch had gone to the Romero residence to investigate after his wife had been unable to get Mrs. Romero to answer her doorbell. Uh, Miss Ralph Moulton, who lives across the street from Romero residence, said she heard a disturbance early Thursday or early Tuesday on the front porch. Miss Moulton said two people, I think I have the next page, left the front porch after the disturbance, went into the lighted living room, and immediately the lights went off. She then heard someone say, oh no, oh no, follow, followed by shut up. Homer Specht, another next door neighbor, said he saw two cars leaving the Romero residence in opposite directions as he was leaving for a hunting trip about 4.40 a.m. One of the cars, he said, was a red and white late model Pontiac, which drove east from home, turned west after rounding a nearby clinic, and then turned again. The other auto, Speck said, was a dark colored Oldsmobile, which drove off west and then turned south, meeting the other car. Neither car stopped he said. The family had been occupying the one and a half story frame house since October and this was so they, they hadn't only been there a few weeks it looks like. The two children were taken to a neighbor's home as city, county and military authorities began their investigation of the death. So now I'm there, I didn't really, there was some articles here and there, but this is a breakdown, a bigger article from 1977. <laughs> you know, I mean, normally when you say, oh, wow, since 77, you, you would think that that one's old. But this is actually like, grisly murder of city nurse remains unsolved. And that was, you know, 18, 
well, actually, yeah, 18 years after the murder. So this is, uh, you know, one of those articles that normally show up. Well, you know, yeah, I hope you know what the hell I'm saying. It's like sometimes <laughs> you go, 1977 isn't the follow-up one because we're not covering 1959 cases. But the November 10th, 1959 murder of Mrs. Fern Romero probably would have been solved had neighbors reported the front porch scuffle they witnessed at the Romero home at 1738 Ash. I wonder if that's still there. bet you that house was there that looks like that age of that house is about that time and let's just make sure yep 17 1738 you can definitely see that so that's the same house well, let's just take a look at what they're saying. So there's a porch here. Uh, that's the porch they were talking about. And the car went around the corner, turned by, this is the clinic right here. Wow, that, even the clinic's still there. You can tell that's what that is. Right? So it went this way, the other car went this way and they met. So it went like this and the other car went like this and then they met up. Crazy, huh? But they did not call the police. And despite extensive efforts by police to find the killer, the case remains unsolved almost 18 years after its per perpetration. And again, this article is from 1977. A, a daughter of the gods, divine, tall, and most... Oh, and most... God, what does that say? Divinely fair was how Fern McGraw Romero was described in her 1952 Centerville, Mississippi school annual. The pretty 25-year-old nurse's body was found a day and a half after at least four neighbors either saw or heard two persons scuffling on the Romero front porch in the early morning hours of November 10th. Kind of makes you think there was three people. Two people that maybe ended up killing her because two cars drove away, right? The victim's husband, Captain, I'll just go with Lewis. Lewis Romero was attending an advanced artillery class at Fort Bliss, Texas, when his wife was killed. The body was found after a neighbor's a neighbor, suspicious over the lack of activity at the Romero home, called a former resident of the home. A former resident contacted a next door neighbor. That's, God, that's a lot of work. You call a former resident and they call the name. A former resident contacted a next door neighbor to investigate. The next door neighbor found the nude body of Miss Romero lying in the bedroom of her home. The victim's 16 month old son sat crying in the middle of a bed, and her seven month old son lie crying in a crib in an upstairs bedroom. A bedspread partially covered the severely bruised body. The victim's throat had been slashed and a collar, well, you know, it almost seems like it's mainly, uh, I mean, it could have been a one person, but the car thing is throwing me off. It sounds like an assault, you know, like, 
Bedspread partially covered the severely bruised body. The victim's throat had been slashed and a collar of thickened dried blood ringed the neck. Police said the murderer drove to the Romero home, arriving just past midnight. Mrs. Romero already had put her two sons to bed and also had bathed. She partially opened the door after hearing the knock, but left the chain latch which her husband had recently installed intact. The murderer kicked open the door and a struggle ensued. Mrs. Romero somehow managed to run past the assailant to the front porch where he caught her. Neighbors said the two persons wrestled from the porch onto the muddy ground. Wow. And nobody called the police. Back onto the porch and then off the porch again. The second time, the man grabbed Miss Romero and carried her into the house. It is believed Mrs. Romero was raped in the middle of the living room where her bathrobe with mud on a sleeve was found. Man, this is crazy. I hadn't read this breakdown yet, so I'm hearing it just like you guys are. Sometime during the struggle, Mrs. Romero probably was knocked unconscious by a blow which broke her nose according to an autopsy. Police speculate she was unconscious when her throat was slit. Okay, well, hopefully that makes people feel better to believe that. Uh, one neighbor who lived across the street from the Romero home told of officers. She heard someone say, shut up, as this, why would somebody, yeah, it's weird, the shut up comment's strange a little bit. That's almost like somebody who knew her or something. And silhouettes fought, and shortly after they entered the home, reported someone screaming, Oh no, oh no. Yeah, jeez. Another neighbor woke her husband, demanding he call police because of the noise, but he didn't dismiss the incident. So, he dismissed the incident as a domestic problem and went back to sleep. Hey, thanks, Zozo and Rochelle Black. Yep. And by the way, I'm doing my earlier show just because I was feeling okay. Sometimes in the evening, it's when it starts getting more sore. Yeah, I'm feeling a little, you know, just right this minute. It doesn't hurt as much as it did yesterday, but I've had it. It wasn't hurting very much two days ago, and then yesterday felt like somebody was sticking a um, a hot rod down my neck. I mean, it just it was horrible, right? So I slept in the same position all night. By I propped up two pillows on my left side, so my neck is crooked to the right and that opens up that um, nerve root a little bit allowing the nerves to breathe so hopefully that helps a little bit I don't know we'll see but even if I get back to where nothing's hurting I'm still gonna go get the surgery I don't I can't have this happen again yeah forget it because I'm losing actual muscle function and so I got to get that fixed. Anyway, let me get back to this. So the husband, the other person who heard it goes, Oh, yeah, forget it. Yeah, it's just a domestic problem and went back to sleep. Had they called the police, we would have caught the guy in the house. Yeah, exactly. Instead, police were forced to launch a massive and extensive search for the slayer, but it would be futile. Investigators interrogated suspects arrested in similar deaths in Tulsa, St. Louis, Missouri, all over the place. A special investigative team of city, county, state, and military authorities headed. I mean, what a... It, just, it does seem like it was a simple one to solve. Like, I mean, it was just really loud and things were going on. People saw it. You know, make a phone call, people. 
Well, that was 1959. I, I think nowadays people would be calling. Although you'd be surprised how they don't. After hundreds of working hours involving some 600 interviews and some $7,000 in expenses, which back then was a lot of money, physical evidence in the case was sorely lacking. You could buy a, a, a house for 7000 back then. Physical evidence in the case was sorely lacking. Her husband said personal items missing were his wife's two handbags containing both sets of keys to their car a small amount of cash and a 35 millimeter camera. Oddly, and for reasons never explained, the inside door frame was missing from, from the scene. Wow. It was never located. <laughs> they must have realized that they had their fingerprints on there. How crazy is that? I mean, what a weird case this one is, right? See, that's what's cool sometimes. You just come across these absolutely really interesting cases that you'll never hear of. Uh, hmm. Oddly, and for reasons never explained, the inside door frame was missing. So the door was kicked in. Remember how it had the chain on? And maybe that broke that out. And then that person grabbed it with their hand and then, or something and felt like, oh, better, I better take this. Okay, let's see. Okay, on November 12th, two days after the body was found, a 28-year-old Lawton man was arrested. He was employed at a service station where the victim traded and on at least one occasion had delivered the woman's car to her home. <laughs> Thanks, Billy Boy Blue. That'll pay for... Um, half the cost of a handy wipe <laughs> at the hospital. You know how the prices are over there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Billy Boy Blue. You're funny. Uh... All right, so this person was employed at a service station, delivered a car there, but he was cleared after a polygraph examination. Psst, really? Several months after the Romero murder, a Roman Catholic priest was charged in connection with the rape and murder of a young McAllen, Texas woman. Officers were immediately notified, Texas officials, that they were interested in knowing whether the priest had been in Latin. And Mrs. Romero was a devout Catholic. A check of signatures in the McAllen Catholic Church Mass book cleared the priest of Lawton's murder. At one point, a young Lawton man demanded he be given a polygraph examination because I don't know if I did it, but I've got to know. He said he frequently drove to the house an old girlfriend had once lived there. Just to remember the good times. He was usually drunk when he drove to the home, he said. The examination proved the man had nothing... No, it didn't prove shit, though. I mean, polygraph tests don't prove a damn thing. As a matter of fact, I think they're only used nowadays to see if somebody's willing to take one. Because if they aren't, ooh, now they're guilty. The killer knew Mrs. Romero well enough that she would open the door for him. And that's what I was thinking. That he And, and also said, shut up. You know, the shut up part seems more of like a personal comment to me. That would open the door for him and did not know her well enough to be allowed to enter. He also knew the officer wrote Mrs. Romero's husband. Let's see. He also knew the officer wrote... Mrs. Romero's husband was away. 
The killer was not familiar with the Romero neighborhood and probably had never been in the home before. However, he did know the address. Supporting the theory was the report of two women who lived two doors down from Romero's. They said shortly after midnight, a car stopped in front of their home. What? Let me see if I let me get back up here. The examination. Okay, one officer now deceased wrote in his notebook his theory of the murder. The killer knew Mrs. Romero well enough that she would open the door for him, but did not know her well enough to be allowed to enter. He also knew. So the killer knew, wait, let's see, he also knew, the officer wrote, so the killer also knew Mrs. Romero's husband was away. The killer was not familiar with the Romero neighborhood and probably had never been to the home before. However, he did know the address. So he thinks maybe he was a hitman, maybe, for the husband, perhaps. Supporting this theory was the report of two women who lived two doors down from the Romeros. They, they said shortly after midnight, a car stopped in front of their home, a car door slammed, and the quick paced sound of a thick, so uh, thick soled shoes could be heard coming from uh, the gravel driveway. The man walked up to the front porch, probably to look at the address number, immediately went back yeah, see, there you go. I mean, look at it. It's hard to see it, right? From the road. So you can't see the top of it there. So at one of these other homes, he ran up to see the number. And then, you know, they obviously didn't have the little GPS coordinates back then. Okay. Is this? Okay, two women who lived two doors down. They said shortly after midnight, a car stopped in front of their home. A car door slammed and quick pace, you know, a guy ran up to check the number. The man walked up to the front porch, probably to look at the address number, immediately went back to his car and drove to the Romero home. The other hypothesized the man went to the home intent on committing rape and not robbery or burglary and the burglar would have gone to the back door he said. The murder performed certain things to cover up tactics to make it appear as though the crime scene was a robbery. According to the investigators, after Miss Romero was killed, the man overturned furniture, ransacked the home, and for some reason took the home's door frame. Also wrote the officers in the files, Miss Romero probably was dead before her throat was slit. Okay, so there wasn't, um, like, so there wasn't um, spurting, you know, like the cast off you would get, like if you cut somebody's throat like that. So maybe she was strangled and then to make sure she died, he cut her throat. Uh, one possible clue to the killer's identity developed during Mrs. Romero's November 20th funeral in her native um, Centerville. A lily floral wreath appeared at the funeral Neither the funeral director nor a Centerville florist could produce records indicating who was the sender. No clues could be developed to the point of leading officers to arrest the person responsible for the murder of Miss Romero. It is only a remote possibility the case will ever be listed as anything other than an unsolved Lawton murder. Man, that's crazy. That was one of the more interesting cases that, uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't know it was going to turn out that way. <clears throat> it's 
especially since <coughs> I mean this looks exactly the same I'm sure So probably went to that one, and then, or this one here, um, or it was the other direction. The Wreath. That would be the name of the short story on it, right? The Wreath. And the Apathetic Neighbors. was it for that story. I wish there was more of that. Hey, Linda Howe. Hey, that's all right. I came on earlier than I was supposed to. Thanks, Sapphire. There was this case, too, that was just solved. I don't know if you saw this one. Yeah. And look at that. Look, look how little there was in the newspaper about this killing. Three weeks earlier, a woman's body... This is just a... a I was talking about something else. <laughs> okay, but listen. To that. Three weeks earlier, a woman's body was found in a plowed field... She had been raped and her throat had been cut. Her identity is still unknown. Okay? See, this is April 15, 1968. And then here it is. Cold case murder solved in Huntington Beach 52 years later. 52 years after the discovery of Jane Doe's body in a Huntington Beach ditch, DNA has given her name and identified her killer. Well, that's that part's incredible. I mean, from 68... The identities of Orange County's oldest Jane Doe murder victim and her killer are now known thanks to DNA. After 52 years of uncertainty, Anita Louise Bateau of Augusta, Maine, was positively identified as the victim of Huntington Beach's longest running cold case. Her killer, Johnny Crisco, was also identified through familial DNA according to the Huntington Beach Police Department. A recently formed investigative genetic genealogy task force. Hey, thanks, Sosa. Initiated by the Orange County District Attorney's Office, helped close the convoluted case after a century after it began. Half a century. Officials are still searching how Pateau and Crisco's paths crossed and what led to her brutal death at age 26. In the late 60s, Pateau left her home to come to Hollywood, and a lot, of, a lot of people would do that, according to Dave Dirking of the task force. She left her home and family in Maine and headed to Hollywood. She wanted to see where movies were made, and she kept in regular touch with her family by mail, according to Dirking. She had every intention of returning home, Kimberly Eds of the district attorney's office told Patch. Her last correspondence was in February 1968, written while living in a rented room in Whittier. Her family never heard from her again. So here's the address, um, or the location, but when you go there today, it doesn't look anything like that. You see, there's all kinds of homes there. So back then there was a field is apparently at this intersection or close to it. Hey, uh, hey, King, 
Who are you talking about, man? I never even talked about that guy. <laughs> you're, you're so ridiculous, man. Yeah, we got a little troll showing up here. Don't block him, though. Well, now, now that he's repeated the same thing twice, I'm going to have to call it a day. See you later. Okay. On March 1968, several young boys playing in a field near Newland Street and Yorktown Avenue found Jane Doe's body in a drainage ditch. She had been raped, severely beaten, and her neck was slashed. Uh, Angela Bennett of the Huntington Beach Police Department said, An officer searched the area where she lay. Investigators found a smoked cigarette butt, among other evidence a blood-spattered floral blouse, purple pants, a pair of muddy loafers, a silver ring with a large costume jewel, all painstakingly preserved as an exhaustive search ensued, including numerous interviews. Wow, so a pair of muddy loafers, silver ring with a large costume jewel, floral blouse. It took an evolution of technology for the names of the woman and her killer to be made. Ultimately, the trail went cold. All evidence entered the realm of cold case with neither the identity, the victim, or her killer known. Her likeness was hand-drawn and shared in hopes someone would know her. Her body was buried in an unmarked grave in a Newport Beach cemetery. Still. Neither the boy who found her body, uh, one of whom became Huntington Beach police officer, now retired, according to the Daily Pilot, for the police forgot about, nor the police forgot about her. <laughs> Just write normal sentences, man. I don't need 16 minutes to finish the sentence. A science improved... A science improved Orange County Cold Case Homicide Task Force kept working the evidence and researching leads. In 2001, the case, case's rape kit was entered into the DNA database. Wow, he actually did a rape case in 68. And a profile for the rapist was identified. Still, both the killer and the victim's identities remained unknown. In 2010, a partial male DNA profile was obtained from the cigarette butt found at the crime scene, and it matched that from the rape kit. Still, no suspect was found. 2011, police released crime scene photos of her body in hopes someone would recognize her. Um, let's see, her case was repeatedly submitted to California DOJ for familial search in CODIS. Fast forward to 2019, a year when answers at last outweighed the questions surrounding Jane Doe's violent death. Hey, thanks, On the Trail. On the Trail, Kim. After the highly publicized identification and arrest of the Golden State Killer, Huntington Beach detectives lobbied with the Orange County District Attorney's Office to use investigative genetic genealogy to both find the killer and identify the victim. It was a DNA miracle that led the task force to Johnny Crisco. There were four brothers, three deceased in the family tree. Johnny Crisco was found to be the primary suspect. Before that, Crisco was, ne was never even a suspect on police's radar. In a stark contrast to the Golden State Killer's highly publicized arrest, police were denied that option. They learned that Crisco died in 2015 of cancer. He was cremated and is buried in Washington State. Well, you're now known as a killer, you whack job. Johnny Crisco was born in Merced. He grew up in Arizona and was involved in a statutory rape before he was 17, according to Durkin. 
He joined the army and spent his enlisted time as a paratrooper, making 15 jumps. After three years, following a failed psychological exam, the army discharged him. He was diagnosed with positive aggressive reaction, or having a pattern of being quickly to anger, easy to feel unjustly treated, chronically resentful, immature, and impulsive. There he is right there. After his stint in the army, Crisco lived, and that was a 1971 image. That was right around the time. Because he, this is from 1968. After his stint in the army, Crisco lived in Empirical Beach in San Diego around 1966, though he was arrested and booked, his records were later purged, according to Deerkin. At some point, he moved to Orange County and later to Washington State. He was married three times, had two children. His children have since passed, as has one of his ex-wives. Yeah. So cool. Cold case solved. They got both the killer and the victim's name, finally. Yeah, now it's been really tough because she was, you know, when she left her family, they might not have known exactly where she went. They figured she was just doing her own thing. And, you know, she's from Maine, about as far away as you can get. Yeah, nobody knew anything. I don't think they knew that she was dead. They probably just hoped she went on and had a good life. It's crazy. Well, does anybody have their uh, any true crime stories? Because that's about all I'm up for now. <laughs> Starting to get a little bit painful now. But I can do some calls for a little bit. So there you go. If you have a true crime story of yourself, yeah, that's only that's what I want calling in. New callers with true crime stories. Wow, their name is Colin Libra Scales. <laughs> okay, what's it got to do with uh, what the show, though, Brianna? Yeah, that sucks. That's, that kind of shit happens all the time. Well, yeah, I, I, you can call him. Anyway, go use the... Uh, just call him, you know, if you have knowledge of a crime, whatever. I'm sure it'll be interesting. I'll be back in a second.
Yeah, I've got to fix some things here. The six one four, whatever the number that is, I don't know. Hello. Hi. Oh wow. Hi. Yeah, you Sorry. Got, yeah, yeah, you got it. Hey, Gray. Um, I just I wasn't sure if I should call in because I've called in three times now. It's Humanimal. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Do you have a story That's that good. you're involved with? Um, or? I do. Um, it 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 was um. When I was working in a commercial furniture business, managing um, for the state I live in, and I had a young sort of business-hungry chef who was setting up a restaurant, and he was involved, obviously, with family. I think his um, brothers, the family, I, I don't really want to... Um, just their reputation but there was obviously drug dealing and things like this and all sorts of stuff going on and the using of their own gear sort of thing and it was a very edgy scary situation and it should tell them like he wouldn't give me money unless I was there making some sort of exchange with my furniture as if I wasn't a legitimate businesswoman with um, a showroom and, and, um, and you know, all of this sort of thing. It was, he thought he was doing, doing some sort of drug deal. Anyway, um, I ended up having to take things um, to his home and try and make some sort of exchange and the brother was there and they're talking to me through the door. This was all very, very worrying and I got quite scared um, and I called up um, a subcontractor that I knew and he sort of and asked him to drive over and just be with me because this was it was such a weird situation anywho it wasn't right then that anything happened to the chef but um, I left the business and two years later um, heard about a shooting of a young chef, um, sorry, this violent death, this battering death of this young guy in his the garage of his home. And when the name was released, it was just the weirdest feeling because I had this sense of doom about this person. Um, the entire time, it was just such a bad feeling being anywhere near him and just seeing how he operated and... Um, yeah, he was brutally murdered. I, um, I don't know what over, but yeah, it was just the strangest feeling and it shook me. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that was my, that was my brush with murder story. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah my, my attention span is probably not as good now because I'm just trying to focus in on how my head is. But everyone else could hear it. I could hear him in there. I can see what you're saying. and I'm sorry that you're not feeling so well. But, no, it was just one of those things where I had a feeling like this, this person is not headed for good things. He had started off with a bright future. Gordon Ramsay had met him, thought that he was so talented. Um, but, you know, when, when drugs and kind of wheeling and dealing and all this paranoia started getting in, I mean, I just had a bad... It was the weirdest thing. I had a bad feeling about this guy's future, and he ended up getting bashed to death in his garage um, two years late. I, I don't anyway. Yeah, so sorry, boring everyone, but um, <laughs> that, that's my my little. <laughs> well, that's a good one. My story. Thanks for calling in. That was cool. Thanks, Gray. Bye. Bye. See you. All right, seven six five. Good evening, Gray. It's Libra Scales. Hello. I hope you're feeling better or get to feeling better soon. Yeah. Can't wait. So, huh? Well, it'll be, it'll be cool at some point. Yeah, definitely. Because the relief is much needed. I can hear it in your voice, you know. Yeah. Um, 
So the true crime story that um, happened that I would like to talk about happened. um, It was July 18th into the 19th of 2016. I lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I lived in a house off of 425 North LaSalle. Uh, Off of where? Where was it? 425 North LaSalle. Um. And so there's like this this side street, um, it's like an alleyway type deal that goes down to dead end street called Robson. And so I had been in the house and um, I lived upstairs. My fiance at the time before he was my late husband, um, we were staying with his grandfather shortly after his grandma died. And um, we had a set of roommates in the room next to us and we're playing PlayStation and I was going to go to the gas station and at the time my late husband said, no, no, just wait a few minutes, you know, and I'll, I'll walk you to the gas station. He said, I don't feel right. Something's weird. Stay, stay in the house. So I said, okay. When, well, when was this? 2016. It was July 18th into the 19th of 2016. It was mm-hmm. a, almost midnight about, it was like 11, I'd say, 11.45-ish, 11.50-ish. Is that where you like lived that. at the 425? That yes, happened? I lived at the 425 North List Isle at the time. Okay. And so I was going to go to the gas station for a pack of smokes. And, you know, like I said, my late husband, he, he said, no, I got this really eerie feeling. I want you to stay in the house. I don't want you to go outside. He said, I will, I will go with you. I see the house right there. <laughs> Yeah, this on, is a corner. The you're you're street. you're right over here. Yeah, right? this one. But yeah, this is that street okay. you mentioned. It's like an alley kind of. Yes, it's like an alley, Robson. Yeah. And so the house that I lived in, that house on the corner, it was a two-story house going up toward Robson. It's four twenty-five. Um, right. Where is he? I'm just doing. I'm just showing yeah. what you're talking 425. about. 425. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're right there. 425 is to your left. Okay. So in the back of that house, back behind there, there's bedrooms upstairs and there's a window up there. If you go down that side street of Robson a little bit, um, go to your left, there's a, a wooden fence on your right hand side there. Yeah, so just, if you, you, go, don't, you don't have to follow what I'm doing. Just just tell your story. And all. Yeah. yeah you know. So if you go into that front front back bedroom window, you can see that fence right there directly from that, that top window. And so we had a set of roommates there, and um, my roommate stayed in that bedroom, and she ran into my room, and, you know, we had been listening, and people had been – popping off fireworks and you know things like that but we heard this loud boom and the first boom hit and we thought was somebody's popping off fireworks still right well we quickly heard more 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 booms and you could tell from the next boom that it clearly wasn't any fireworks at all and so my roommate had ran into the room and she said Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. She said, look out the window right now. Look out this window. So I look out the window and there is a vehicle that's sitting there right next to that fence. The front, um, on the driver's side, the back driver's side door. Well, what fence are you talking about? This wide. fence? Are you talking about the fences? This, this, this one? brown fence right here. Go to your left. Yeah. Right here. Just right here. Right. Yes, this this big big large fence, but right here on the side where this this curb is. Yeah, but I can go in okay. the, onto that little street. So you're saying? Yes. Like right, right over, here, right exactly, exactly right on that fence. No, nope. yeah. go back to where the street was, where the curb was. Uh huh. So just like right here. Yeah, right where the curb was, because right turn your right, yeah, right there, like exactly where this car was parked, because you could see this car from the bedroom window. Yeah, right there. Straight down to. The, the street right there. Because that's the bedroom window my roommate, right there, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So my roommate runs into my room and she says, hey, um, I don't know what's going on. She said, there's a car that's parked sitting right there. She said, the lights are on. She said, um, 
the the back uh, passenger side door and the driver's side is open, she said, and I don't know what's going on, but very rarely was there traffic down that road. You know what I mean? And she said, something's wrong, something's wrong. So when you go to that window, you could see that there was light on inside of the car. There was somebody moving around in that car. Um, there, I, I, we didn't want to go outside, but you could tell that somebody was clearly hurt. There was something going on. So we dialed 911. We were on hold with 911 for 20 minutes, and there were two people shot in that car. Um, and it was a, a young boy. He was 18 years old, and there was a girl in the passenger seat. The girl survived the shooting. Um, and come to find out, like, because it, it took forever, and there was homicide detectives and everything all over the place, and, you know, the police showed up questioning and all that stuff. But I will never forget it because the next day um, – we got a hold of the newspaper, the local newspaper, and it was two children. They were 18 and 16 years old who were involved in this, and they had went on some sort of a spree that night, and they attacked five other people after they had shot and killed this kid and this girl. So wow. it was just, it wow. was eerie, and it stuck with me. It still sticks with me. Well, where was um, that? Where did the person live that was shot? He lived somewhere in Indianapolis, somewhere on that that side of town. Well, why were they right? Exactly well, why were they right? Ra- why were they right here, though, shooting? Well, it came out later on um, after the two children were convicted. They both had gotten like 130 years in the state prison, uh-huh. and apparently, this kid was trying to sell them a gun, and they were trying to go somewhere where there wasn't a bunch of heat. Apparently, the kid had said, "Meet me in this spot." And, you know, they had gone to two previous places where he said, meet me at, and he had moved location. So because there was not much traffic on that particular road and it was a dead end and it was, it's fairly quiet over there at night. This was the spot that he chose to do this gun exchange. And unfortunately, instead of making his gun exchange the way that he wanted to, he ended up losing his life. So... Yeah, that's my well, that's, that's a, my true crime story. That's a crazy one. So, yeah, and I mean the kids they they attacked other people too. So there was like five people total victims that night. So, what uh, what year was that again? I was going to see if there was two thousand sixteen. The kid's name was Dayron Strauss. Um, there's there's newspaper articles about it. Well, that's and what, what, what that when in two thousand sixteen. July 18th oh. into the 19th well, this, of 2016. This, this, this street view right here is just four months later, November 2016. Yeah. This street view right here. So it looked just like yeah. this, basically. This street, yes, view out, this street view out here is 2019, so it's quite a, quite a bit yeah. later. But. And I felt so bad because after that child died, there was like animals, stuffed animals and... Um, candles and things all along that fence but his mother she was a very religious lady and that lady would drive and she would leave her car doors open and she would blast Christian music and she would be on her knees crying every single day because she could not she couldn't deal with losing her son you know and it just my heart hurt for her so badly And I didn't know what it was that the child was shot over until, I don't know, like a couple of months ago when they were, um, they had something in the newspaper about the appeal that the two people who were convicted had filed. Huh. Well, uh, you know, I don't, at least you weren't involved with it. I mean, you saw it or saw, heard some sounds. No, I saw, like, it, I heard the shots. I, I heard the shots. It was just, it was crazy because the first shot I heard, you know, I looked at my husband and he was like, oh, well, somebody's popping off fireworks. And I was like, okay. But then when those next pops came, it became so apparent. And I looked at him and I said, honey, those are not fireworks. And when my roommate came in the back room and she was like, hey, you got to come right now. I mean, it was just so. 
But what, oh my god! Maybe, like, did you guys did, did you guys leave? Food. Did you guys leave the house and walk over there or something? Or? No, no, I did not go outside. I dialed nine one one immediately, um, well, and go. I stood in the window and I stared in the window because it, the two people who had shot him were already gone by the time my roommate came in there and came to the window. I mean, she had been. Um, sitting in the room and her bed was right under that window and so she you know she said there were people out there there were people out there um but she didn't she couldn't see who they were because that that corner right there where that fence is there's not a street light over there that right. works that but, you could yeah. see anything but the person like, that was when shot well, look, when the person was shot um that person lived though in this situation or not the the driver lost his life. The person that was in the passenger seat of the vehicle, she survived. Oh wow! Okay, so it was a mur yeah. murder just right where my camp, right where I am, right here, right. Yeah, basically on that fence. Go to your left. Yeah, just right here. Right there. And then where the right shadow there. is. Yep. Right, right? That. Yep. That's where the car. I mean, exactly where those arrows are. Right there. That's exactly where the car was sitting. Let me just. <laughs> so it just weird how street view or, it, like right right here was it actually on the curb too like right in here or just right yeah it was right there actually on the curb the car was parked right next to that brown fence right there so it was ne it was on the grass like though so it actually went up on the yeah. curb and everything no it was it was right there like on the street oh right you know, on, next okay. to the curb right there parked you know and um yeah and you can see just, from right there yes yeah. if you if you backed the arrows up just a little bit I mean it was exactly the right angle where they were parked, you could see it from that window right there. Yeah, and well, it, it just, only lets you go like every t ten feet. Like that's it, right? Like yeah, when I yeah, move it, exactly. I can't, I can't, like right that spot. Yeah, I mean, I can't. Yeah, it, know, it, so just like right here, but no. you can see from right up there. Yeah, it was like right at that spot where you could see it perfectly from that window. I mean, and you, when you looked out the window, the back passenger door on the driver's side was wide open. I mean, the, the the light was on and I could see somebody moving around in there. I, the, the person that was in the driver's seat, you could see him moving around. And it was like, I was on the phone with 911. We were on hold for 20 minutes and I felt like they could have, somebody could have gotten there quicker and they could have saved him. That, that boy probably could have lived, but I remember standing there in the window and I'm waiting for them to answer the phone on 911. I'm on hold. I'm on, you know, and I remember just looking and I just, the person stopped moving. He I mean, stopped how moving. did you describe when you're on 911? Did you describe it as um, somebody got shot or? Yes. Yes. I was like, this person got shot. You know, I, I heard the gunshots. I saw somebody moving around, and the 911 operator was like, well, is somebody moving around anymore? And I was like, I don't I don't see anybody moving, you know? I said, do you want me to go outside? They're like, no, 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 do not go outside. Stay in your home. Just, just stay there. And then when the police did make it there, you know, I remember them, you know, bringing all their, their police cars and the crime scene tape and everything, and they said, you know, don't leave, don't go anywhere. Um, they said that they would send a homicide detective to my home to come talk to me and a homicide detective came and talked to me probably about an hour and a half afterwards. And that was it. Wow. That was it. Well, the, so, it yeah, seems like the then, witness, the, the girl that lived would probably know, have some answers. Yeah. I mean, she lived, I don't know, like they they uh, blocked her name out from like court proceedings and stuff like that. Like they kept yeah. her identity private. Are you sure it was 20 um, minutes? Like literally like, yes, it was literally 20 minutes because That's I was crazy. freaking out and I was looking at my phone at the timer because I was getting irritated and I kept telling my roommate, I said, grab your cell phone, dial 911. Somebody else grabbed their phone, dial 911. And it just, you just kept, kept waiting. I, I promise you it was 20 minutes. I was so frustrated and upset, you know, because that kid, he could have lived. He, he I, I mean, he probably, he probably could have made it had they had gotten there quicker, had they had answered the phone just that much, you know, that much sooner. It was a long time, a really long time that we were on hold. It was crazy. Wow. Huh. 
Have you ever asked, tried to get answers for why it would take that long? That's just... No, I mean... That's just crazy. It's like That particular side of town in Indianapolis is a very high crime rated area. Uh, well, um, I mean, so, that, that actually... I mean, I mean, even though that's like a, you know, that's one of the shitty parts about living in shitty parts of town. It's like there's mm-hmm. so many things going on that you call in and then they're probably working this other one, this one, this one. They'll get somebody out there. Yeah. Says, you know. Yeah. But yeah. like, but if you live in a normal society, 911 gets there quick because it's an unusual thing. If you live in a war zone, it's right. sort of hard to, uh, you know, I'm not making excuses. I'm just saying why it might be like in Chicago right now, right? If somebody said, oh, mm-hmm. hey, there's a shooting down the street. Well, yeah, yeah, there's one down that street, too. There's one over there. There's one over there. There's one over there. There's one, you know, so they're all, you know. Yeah. Yeah, 20 minutes yeah, sounds I mean, ludicrous no matter there, how you look like, at it. But. Yeah, I don't live there in that area anymore. I, I moved away from that area a long while ago. It just happened to be the experience that I had when I lived in that area, and I was like, never again. <laughs> yeah. Never again. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> So, I mean, the next day when I picked up the paper and they mentioned that, you know, this shooting was connected to five other incidences that had happened over that night, it just, it really shook you. And then to Uh, know that the two that were involved, one was 18 years old and the other one was 16 years old. Yeah, see, that makes sense. Well, what's interesting about that is maybe that's why it took so long. There was four other incidents going on. Yeah, yeah. But so, you know, they should have enough my... police to handle that. You know, right? Yeah. Well, well, good story. That's my true crime story. Well, it's so a sad one, but wanted uh, to share it with you. It was interesting. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night. You too. feel better. Oh, thanks. All right, bye. Bye. All right, seven three one. You're on. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Pretty good. Who's this? Darlene White. Darlene White. Darlene White. (laughs) Yeah, I like the accent. (laughs) (laughs) What's going on? (laughs) Okay. Uh, Are you ready? Yeah, we're, (laughs) yep, I'm ready. Okay, this happened in Dyersburg, Tennessee. How do you spell that? D y e r s b u r g. Okay. And where, right, and his name is. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say where in this town. Okay, it was on Joyce Street. Joyce. Yeah, J o y c e. Okay. Okay, hold on one second. I'm gonna, something happened. All right. Oh, well, I've just, this is me back, but I, the Freak family sent me a, you guys sent me a package for getting well. It says, hope this brightens your day, Gray, get well soon from Miss Skiss, Cairo, and all the Freak family. How cool is that? (laughs) Well, thank you. (laughs) That was nice of you guys. See, I got a smile on my face, even though my neck hurts. All right, now go ahead. Tell tell your story. (laughs) I don't mean to, but thank you guys. 
Okay, um, I grew up with this guy. His name's Stephen Lynn Hughley. You want me to spell his last name for you, or if you want to look him up? Uh, let me just put a pin here really quick. Okay. All right, what's his, uh, what's his name? Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Lynn, and his last name is H-U-G-U-E-L-E-Y. Lynn, like Lenny? Like... Stephen Lynn Hughley. Well, you say Lynn, but is that Lynn? Like L-E-N? L-Y-N-N. -E -L -E -E -N. -Y -N -N. Oh, okay, see, I needed to get that right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, right, you so guys. Thanks again. Everybody's talking about it in there. All right. Let me see. So, what year was this? In 1986. And then, what state was it? Um, I'm trying to remember. Tennessee. Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. Tennessee. Let me just. I have his name. I see it in newspaper here. Um, 1987. Yeah, he lied about everything. Looks like he was in prison at some point. In 86. That's when it started. 1986? Okay. Yeah. So his, his mom is my aunt's sister. My, my uncle was married to him, so we share an aunt and uncle. So he, he robbed the house when he was 18. You there? Yeah, yep, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, you sound okay. just like, look so, at you and Sassmare need to call in at the same time. And there's another person, <laughs> too. <laughs> I don't know what the hell, you, who's who? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. All right, so he robbed a house, and uh, one of this guy my dad worked for, and his mom found out, and she told him, she, we called him Stevie, and she told him, you know, Stevie, if you don't take all that back, I'm fixing to call the police on you. Well, he got mad and left, and she called my aunt and told him, then told her what was going on. Well, Steve come back with a rifle and shot her 17 times. Wow. So, then he wrapped her body up and put all her ID in her in a blanket and threw her in the Roel and bottom. Well, my dad and his uncle also lived next to me, and they saw him driving her car. And so they called the police. And, you know, the police arrested him, and they couldn't find her. He told them what he, you know, told them what he did. But uh, they finally, they had to take him to the Rolling Bottoms to find her. So they sent him, you know, life in prison. Then in 91, he stabbed the inmate and kills him. And in 98, he stabbed another inmate, but he didn't die. And in 02, he stabbed his counselor. I mean, I'm talking about stab like 30-something times. And kills them. Well, it looks like he, he got the he death penalty for these, the prison ones. Yeah, he he did. He got the death penalty, and because he he never appealed anything until he got the death penalty. Now he's using all his appeals and stuff, and because uh, he's not he don't really want to die. But like I said, everything he puts is lies. You know, it's he said he killed his mom over a girlfriend. He was only he was eighteen, right? At the time, what he, he was, was only eighteen. Yeah, about eighteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but we grew up together from birth, you know, and, uh, but yeah, it was, you know, Christmas and everything because our families, you know, were together. And let me read this thing yeah, that yeah. I found here. It says, death row inmate mm -hmm. Stephen Lynn Hughley has been granted an automatic stay of execution after deciding to resume his appeals process. Hughley, 38, had been scheduled to die August 15th for fatally stabbing prison counselor so that person was just somebody who worked there, Delbert Steed. Yeah. At the that's probably right. why he got the death penalty. They wouldn't have cared if it was for the, an inmate. At the Hardman mm. County Correction Complex in 2002, where he was already serving time for killing his mother in 1986, Circuit Court Judge Weber McGraw granted the stay last week. State Court System spokeswoman Sue Allison said Tuesday, the judge order was largely a formality. Blah 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 blah. Until last week, Hughley had resisted appeals. So is he, um, did he ever get executed? Or No, he's still alive. He's in Nashville. But now he's appealing everything because they were going to put him to death by electrocution. And he says the only way he won't appeal is if they give him a lethal injection. 
So, but yeah, he's meaner than snake. And, and my aunt, you know, because that was my that was Rachel. That was his mom's name. Is the only kid. My aunt sends in, you know, TVs. He gets cell phones, you know, and he's on death row. He gets all this stuff. Hmm. It's weird. And like the only time he's, he's only mentioned basically. What? He's only mentioned about one time in like the entire Tennessee newspaper history, and it was just the one I just read you. Let me see if I can find. Okay, him. if you if you Google Stephen Lynn Hughley, it should pull up a lot of stuff. And yeah, he's even Google. got videos. Really? Huh? Yeah, and then he went before they caught him. He went and uh caught the house on fire but the her house before they found her body what was your what was his mom's name rachel waller rachel and she was waller waller you... she was married, yeah w-a-l-l-e-r she was married to a cop and they had to get divorced they got divorced because steve was so mean so her husband left her Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I can't. It's weird. Some some newspapers they don't have very many in newspapers dot com. It's probably on Google. I'm sure. Yeah, it is. It'll pull a lot up on Google. I mean, interviews and everything. Yeah. But yeah, it, it wow. was something else. That's crazy. Yeah, that is close. So where were you living mm -hmm. at the time? I lived. Uh, I lived, and he's on Joy Street, so I lived like there was four houses between his street and my street. So Joy, so he his street right has a dead end, right? Right, the dead end. He lived in the second house on the left. On the way down the street? Yeah. Is it still there now? Did they get rid of it? I mean, it looks like yeah. it's... No, it's still there. My, my cousin actually owns it now. He rents it out. Oh, is that the one that's made out of brick, kind of at one level? Yeah. Yeah, it's brick. And it's just one. Well, most of them are just one. But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah okay. they're all one level. I don't know if you can see it. And but. then I lived in the main road. I mean, he was at my house, you know, all the time. Because, you know, we were raised like family. Like I said, you know, his mom, his mom's sister married my mom's brother. So, you know, we shared the same aunt and uncle. And then his uncle and aunt, another one lived next door to me. Hmm. Huh. So he just went in there and ended up shooting his mom 17 times? 17 times. Mm -hmm. Said it was because of a girlfriend. Right, up. Hmm. No, it was because he robbed the house. Well, he said it was and, because uh, of the girlfriend. And she was going to turn Yeah, he lied and told everybody it was by the girlfriend and the mom was calling her names, which is a total lie because, uh, you know, Rachel was, she wasn't like that at all. It was because she, she was going to turn him in. For all that jewelry and stuff. Hmm. Well, said he never left prison again for the rest of his life. After no, that. he didn't. <laughs> and he's smart. He's like 130 something. Yeah, well, it was kind of smart that he waited and waited and waited until just about when he's going to get the death sentence. He goes, oh, you know what? I think I will do my appeals process. You know, yeah, then it's like now you got 10 years, at least 20 years even after that. That's just crazy. Mm hmm. You know. Yeah, and like I said, he's on death row. He gets a TV. He gets cell phones. You know, he gets all this mess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just... Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Sometimes I got some weird <laughs> shit going on. I mean, I don't know. It, don't it'd be know. kind of... Even though he was cruel and in, inhumane, it'd be weird to stick somebody in a box for 35 years with no stimuli. That'd be make us look yeah. like barbarians. I wonder what they get to watch on television. Can they watch anything they want, or just? Yeah, he can watch anything. They probably got CNN piped into him. Yeah, yeah. yeah he and he's always like I said. You need to look it up on Google because he's always uh, sending letters to like senators and governors, and that, like I said, he's really smart, you know. And he's like, if if you want me to do this, then you need to do that. It's it's really crazy. Do you ever notice when you go to airports around mm -hmm. the country that's always CNN, but they don't have, any, like, Fox News will never be on in there? Cause it's, you know. I've never been to an airport. <laughs> never been to an airport? Oh. <laughs> no, nope, not ever. Well, if I never had to go to one, I wouldn't want to go there either. Because <laughs> I hate flying yeah. a lot. 
But hey, yeah, good. Well, um, thanks for the story. That was a good one. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you. And yeah. hope you get better soon. Oh, thank you. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye. All right. Nine Thanks seven eight. You're very welcome. Thank you. Hello. You got to turn off the better. audio, or I'll let you get that sorted out. When you're when you're doing this, don't listen on the show. Listen on your phone. Okay. Sorry. 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 Okay. Here it is. So you're on there. Okay. You ready? Sorry. Hey. Who's this? Uh, BBT. All right. BBT. So um, this happened in um, Woburn, Massachusetts. It was on Taunton Ave. I can try to find How do you the spell exact that? address. Uh, Woburn, W-O-R-U-B-U-N. W-O-B-U-R-N. Like Woburn. Oh, wow. Okay. And what street? And it's Taunton, T- Taunton Ave. How do you spell that? T A U. I'm trying to find the exact address. So T A U T U N. That doesn't exist. That. Right. Try T. I'm trying to look it up. T A U T A U N. No, I might have put T A W. Oh, T A T T A T A U T A N. Yeah, I have T A U T right. Or N. T A U N. Oh, like sorry. taunting T-A-U-N. somebody. Okay. Taunting, yeah. Yep. I'm sorry, it's the, uh, it's the Boston accent. <laughs> well, how do you spell like a T A U? Just do the whole word, but slow, you know? I did, all right. T A U uh-huh. N T O N. Taunting. Okay. All right. Av. I'm trying to find the exact address, but so far that's. Okay. Does that exist? Well, there's one in Providence, Rhode Island. No, it's in Mass. I'll look. I'll look at the address. Anyways, this happened in 2004. Uh-huh. Um, it was it was a, a a neighbor of mine. I was actually dating the her the brother. Um, so it was a it was a mother that lived there with her um, daughter who was 12 years old and her baby son, like a crib age baby. I don't even know how old. A few months old. Um. And this actually cha- ended up changing the um, the rape laws and how people are supposed to how people have to um, like you know put their names on the the um, the list you know the the when they're the the rape list. Mm-hmm. Um, so so it ended up being it was actually crazy how um, how it ended up happening to how he how they solved it but she ended up being murdered the mother was murdered um and the 12 year old what was horrible was the 12 year old daughter walked down she was viciously raped murdered like she her cut her throat was cut she was all while she was on a couch um they, they said that like that that's how it happened it was all contained to a couch all the dna everything they had the dna everything but they couldn't match it to anyone um, so they interviewed like everybody i mean this this was like a local like where i lived and i actually had, i was a social worker at this school with a 12 year old went to school which made it absolutely worse um so what happened so she the, the they said that the the 12 year old her name was Alyssa, she you know walked down on it while it was happening and he ended up chasing her up the stairs it was like a, a little townhouse he cha- changed her up to her uh, to, into her bedroom and they said it was i mean this was a quote a vicious fight she fought i mean i mean i could like it makes me sick to think about it, it i mean he ended up slitting like gutting her slitting her throat i every i mean what was her name way that it, what was her name her name was uh, her, the last name well the whole name yeah just uh, Alyssa presti joanne presti and how do you P-R-E- spell it? Well, I mean, Alyssa. P-R-E. Yeah, and Joanne. The daughter was... Alyssa. I know, but I need you to slow down and give me... I mean, I don't know, you know, words, names are spelled differently Presti. all over the place. Okay, so... P-R-E. I know, but I don't even know... S-T-I. Okay. P-R-E. Joanne. S-T-I. S-T-I. Okay, and then Joanne, you're saying that? Because a minute ago you said it differently. Joanne with an E. J O A N N E. Uh huh. 
and that so it should come right up under that. Well, yeah, I'm looking at different, doing it different. In Ma and it's in um, Massachusetts. Woburn, Mass. Yep, Woburn. Yep. I can give you the guy, the murderer's name. And that's the twelve-year-old that was killed. Yep. So she was. She like that was the saddest part is that she walked in on it. So she ended up seeing the the mother, um, you know, having this happen to her, and walked in on it, and then became a victim herself. He chased her up there. The other. So then. So how they ended up. Yeah, that's them right there. So how they ended up finding it was the nobody answered the phone. So the mother wouldn't answer the phone. And unfortunately the parents, which I grew up with these, the parents um, of Joanne and the grandparents of Alyssa, they, she wasn't answering her phone. So they drove over there and they walked in on it and it was horrible. But what the, what another horrible part was is that there was a baby in the crib that the, the murderer didn't know about. So he was in his crib for like three or four days, totally dehydrated. He ended up living totally dehydrated wow. you know no food they said he sucked his fingers so so intensely because he was so dehydrated that it, they like he almost like took the skin off his fingers from just sucking from you know wow. being starved and dehydrated they said the diaper was horrible thank god he lived um the so they didn't know who did it they 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 like really looked for it. they had dna everywhere all of his sperm was uh, everywhere from you know raping her he didn't. He didn't rape the the twelve year old, but he he. I mean, she fought. That I saw pictures of like the her bedroom. It was unreal. Um, so what what they why they changed the the rape laws was because I mean the um the sex yeah, offender the, um, sex the offender list to, um, to have the sex offender list. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Thank you. I was blanking on that. Thank you. So they changed that. So what happened was is. They ended up, how they find it, long story short, is how they ended up finding this guy was fascinating. They were going through so much evidence, and it was a boyfriend, okay, of this Joanne, the mother's friend on the street, okay? So he came over and helped, like, set up her, her um, you know, her, like, you know, her computer and her internet access and little odd jobs. But they found him by going through film because back then it was like real film that you got to live it. You know, you got, um, you know, you had to go and bring it to like CVS to have it developed and all yeah. that. But they went through it and they saw this guy in the background picture of like a birthday party. So they were like, they looked who, at who it was. That's how they found him. They looked at who it was and he had like a rap sheet. Um, but he wasn't registered because it was his girlfriend's apartment. So he was sleeping over there, practically living there. But he didn't put his name on. He didn't have to put it at that time. You weren't required to put your name on a registry, if you you know what I'm saying. So they 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 like worked so hard to change the laws, um, so that it, like if you're staying at at a at a girlfriend's or a boyfriend's house for you know any any amount of time. I guess there's a set amount of time. You know, more than a day or a night, you have to register there too. So I mean, it ended up being that, you know there was something good that came out of it because they did work. I mean, they still, they still, you know, advocate for different, you know, offender laws and all that stuff. But it's a, it's a fascinating case, like from the start yeah. to the beginning. Of, the Bozanowitz, Bozanowitz is the guy, right? Yep. 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 Yeah. So like I said, it, it, I mean, thankfully the, the little boy lives. I mean, unfortunately he's grown up without his mother and as he, he was adopted by the grandparents. But she lived, but, the I mean, mom lived. Did the mom live or? No, the mother and the daughter both died. Oh yeah. yeah. She, so he needed, he needed to kill her because she saw him. Do exactly. That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. She, and she knew him because he was the, that's the worst part as she walked down and she knew this guy from the neighborhood. You know what I mean? He was the, it was Joanne, the mother's best friend's boyfriend. Uh -huh. I mean, it was horrible. So, you know, like, it was, I mean, like they said, they had the DNA. Um, and the two brothers, so she had two brothers, uh, Joanne and the uncles, and they were Marines, very tough, tough, tough kids. And that, everyone thought they were going to, he was, that they were going to kill him. I mean, it, it's fascinating that they haven't. I, they were out, like, out saying there, the court case and, but the other thing that they they had they you know got successfully changed is that I guess there's something about like a, when you clean up a um, you know a murder scene. So they walked in on this, and I guess it became like their responsibility to clean this mess after and move her out, move the the couch out, 
So that was another change that they, you know, they advocated that family members shouldn't be left to clean up, you know, a crime scene and, and move out the couch that the poor woman was murdered on. And you know what I mean? So they, they worked real. They, they did as much as they could to advocate and, you know, both parents, but it was awful. I mean, yeah. it, it was, it was a horrible, horrible, like all of it, the poor 12 year old. I mean, she, like you said, she, there was no choice. I mean, she walked right in on that and she knew who he was. So it was, it was bad, but, but I, but it's fascinating. Like I said, I, I couldn't believe how they ended up catching this guy is just that one little picture took them off to, to check this guy out. And that, and they said that they were immediately like suspect about, who, about his involvement because he had the 12 year old's braces like on his hands from punching her so he had cuts all on his knuckles and they knew it was from they, they figured out that it was something about um, how 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 like the I guess from the 12 year old's mouth they, they concluded that she must have been punched from the way her braces were through her lips so they like the it was they were did a phenomenal job investigating it i mean people have always said that especially back then when you know it wasn't as they didn't have as much you know Mm -hmm. resources as they do now but but yeah that was the how they like tipped that tipped them off right away when they looked at this guy's hands and they said it was like almost it was almost like an impression of her braces it was awful yeah it's crazy so well maybe i'll read this one out loud here in a second but let me uh well, good. Uh, okay. Thanks for calling in with the story, but I'll read through this, see what. All right, thanks. Um, but I'm going to end. Feel better, Greg. Well, thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah, I appreciate Sorry, it. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, it's the Boston talk. It's fast. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, you guys are fast over there, man. Yeah, in Boston, yeah. we just, you, know, we, you guys should all be we auctioneers. Double down. Double down. Yeah, auctioneers. We double down. We get a lot accomplished. <laughs> yeah, it's probably you guys should all be teachers. You could teach the kids twice as much. Yeah, that's what we do. That's why I work in a school system. We get a lot accomplished today. There you go. There you go. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Sorry. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hope you feel better. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. I'm going to make that the last one. Um, so the investigators believe that Joanne C. Presti, the Woodman woman, uh, found slain with her 12-year-old daughter last week, was sexually assaulted before she was killed, law enforcement officials said. Although investigators have not ruled out the possibility that the killings occurred after a consensual encounter, they have recovered evidence of a sexual nature and now considered it a key to identifying the killer. Well, yeah, the semen, I'm sure. On uh, One theory investigators are pursuing is that the killer first had sex with Presti, 34, killed her, then slashed 12-year-old Alyssa Presti's throat to eliminate her as a witness. Well, it sounds like that theory was the correct one. Seth Horowitz, a spokeswoman for Middlesex uh, District Attorney Martha Coaxley, declined yesterday to comment on whether there is a sexual component to the crime. All I can say is that it is a very active investigation. The bodies of the two victims were discovered inside their uh, Totman, it's Totman Drive home on January 7th, three days after Joanne Presti was last heard from, authorities said. Police were called by the Presti parents who became worried after not being able to contact her. Police found Joanne Presti dead of a blow to the head and multiple stab wounds, her clothing in disarray, face down on a couch on the floor of the duplex apartment authority says Alyssa was found I gotta go to that next page hmm is this eight yeah that's not a doesn't look like a continuation there. Oh yeah, the, uh, two and a half year old son Sean was also found in the apartment unharmed. But let me go back. I think I might be missing something. Alyssa was found upstairs. Okay, so then Presty, two and a half year old son Sean was also found in the apartment unharmed. 
but undernourished, Coxley office said. Denise Montero, spokeswoman for State Department of Social Services, said yesterday that Sean Presti remains in foster care. His family has contact with him, he said. Presti's 10-year-old son, Justin, was not in the apartment at the time of the slaying. He had moved out last year to live with his father in Revere. The three children were fathered by different men, and the fathers have been questioned by authorities. The law enforcement sources said yesterday that investigators believe the case is leading away from the fathers as suspect. Thomas Pollock, Sean's father, former Boston Bruins winger John Carter, Alyssa's father, and Frank Mar Martineau, Justin's father, have denied any involvement in the crime. Neighbors said Presti and her daughter were popular among the residents of Topman Drive, a quiet street dominated by duplexes. Presti, a licensed optician who had mostly stayed home since the birth of her young son, often sat outside and watched over the neighborhood children. Yeah. So this is before they figured out what the hell happened. Anyways, wow, that's a crazy one. But I think I'm about done now. I can feel the, the pain kicking in. All right, everybody. So I appreciate... Um, I'll go check out my package here in a minute, the uh, package you guys sent. <laughs> but thank you guys very much. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for the little care package there. Appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for calling in and hanging in there. Hopefully, I'll try to be able to do shows, but, you know, I'm just kind of snuck this one in because I felt a little bit, didn't feel as much pain. Hey, thanks for joining the, uh, you're a too light. Golly, golly. And thank you, Dottie O, Caspi, and Horses Rock. Yeah, and I saw your, uh, thanks, Billy Boy Blue up above. Jack and Jill went up the hill each with a buck and a quarter. Jill came down with 250. Ooh, okay. I gave it a shot. All right, everybody. Hey, thanks, Mysterious Monkey. Wow, that was so cool. A cat eye donation. Right at the end, the buzzer gonna help out the end of the month here yep yeah yeah <laughs> you guys would laugh if you could see me right now <laughs> but uh, I'm not gonna show it but anyways all right everybody thank you very much uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow or the next day who knows but until next time be safe. Oh, wait. Make sure that you're uh, washing your hands, maintaining social distancing. Turns out masks are sort of the key to everything. So wear your masks when you're out in public, all right? All right, everybody. Until next time, be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a... Crime dissector, flag rejecter, I'm a certified human lie detector, gonna get ya, on a stretcher, if you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector, is my nectar, Professor Grey is gonna give another lecture, crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector, fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector, on his pector, with a respect Remember, I've a temple fucking checkcha. I have no agenda. I'm the pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yay! Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. Right. Well, at least you did a show today, didn't you, Gray? You did a show. That's okay. Yeah, I did a show. Yep, we were all there. And yes, of course, I appreciate everybody's support out there. It's amazing.
as I said at the beginning of the show, it just made me feel really good seeing all the supportive comments. Oh, okay, good, cool. I wasn't sure if everybody heard it or not. Okay, hey, uh, thank you, Gray, and good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Lou? Wow, you sound kind of weird. Oh, okay. Hey, good night. <laughs> People are crazy. All right, have a good one.